Welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British perspective by two brothers who consider themselves to be reasonably normal, sane, and very much not professionals. We are lay people on most of the topics we tackle here on the show. We do this one topic at a time, and we react to suggestions. We are Jeffrey Campos, that's me, an engineer and devil's advocate, and my brother, Benjamin D. Campos, a designer and believer. Ben? Hello. We like to choose a topic of interest. We spend a very small amount of time researching it, and we have a discussion, and we publish the notes. The notes are available on our website, eclecticist.co.uk, where you can open them up and read along. We like to think that the main benefit of doing this is to foster a greater understanding of the world before we die and to prompt further thought and discussion from our listeners. And of course, we obviously learn something about the topics as well. The topic we are discussing this week is mobile phones. Imagine a world where you forgo any plausible claim to privacy by paying for-profit companies in other lands to collect and analyze your personal data. Imagine further that the means with which said companies acquire your data is through a portable computer bristling with sensors that you literally wear on your body most of the time. The portable device, communication and data services are so important to your life that you're driven half mad with worry and misery when parted just for a short period. Welcome to the reality of 21st century mobile telephony, where everyone life logs into their very own portable telescreen. We're not going to talk about Tic Tacs this time. So, mobile phones. We completely take these things for granted, to a, an insane degree. I just, I can't get over how ubiquitous they are. You know, within eyesight, everywhere I look, I can see them. If, if there are people around, look at the people. And more often than not, a lot of them are holding a mobile phone in their hands. Does this not strike you as amazing? Yeah, it is amazing. Particularly for us, you and I are old enough where we remember a time before mobile phones were ubiquitous. Well, they've always been around in, in our lifetimes. And I remember when they were the stuff of a madman's dreams. It's like we'd see some hotshot on TV who had like a mobile phone that was the size of a toaster. And we would um, see occasionally, well, I certainly would, mobile phones, you know, in use where someone would have this phone, but it would also have be carrying this big black box along with it. Yes, the good old suitcase phones. Yeah, uh, and I think that must have been late 80s or something or into the 90s. Even into the 90s, they were, they were huge. And I only got a mobile phone in the late 90s. And that's probably after everyone already had one. And you said in your little intro there about little computers. And even though you could argue that they were computers of sorts, but they only became smartphones easily within the last 10 years. Maybe not even much as that. Yeah, I think right at the very edge of my memory, I remember portable telephones. But uh, certainly portable telephones are a far cry from what we take for granted these days. But I was just trying to think... What was it that was just as ubiquitous before phones were on the scene? And the only thing I could think of was cigarettes. I think if you ever looked at a crowd of people uh, before mobile phones came along, I think you saw a lot of cigarettes. I remember seeing a lot of cigarettes. Or maybe uh, Walkmans, maybe. I mean, maybe. Well, as ubiquitous as mobile phones there are now are watches. Was the lack of mobile phones. Yeah, there's that. No, we're watches. I think more people had watches. I, I see an awful lot of watches these days. I, I keep thinking that watches have fallen out of fashion and, and favor, and people generally don't bother with them anymore. But when I take a little mental poll on public transport and I look around, pretty much everybody is wearing a watch. I think they're as popular now as they ever were. We should probably do a, do a show on watches. Yes, yes, and your What's the word? <laughs> You're flip-flopping on the whole watch thing. Yeah, I know. That's not... Um, but that wasn't the point I was making. I'm not saying there are less watches. I'm just saying watches could be seen as analogous to mobile phones. Everyone had a watch. Now everyone has a phone. Same level of ubiquity. I don't know. I think you're right. I, well, I think probably people... I think a lot of people have given up on watches. And I think... Mobile phones are more common than watches ever were, I think. Mm. 
Maybe. I mean, that's a baseless claim, but uh, I get the feeling that definitely someone's going to have a um, a phone on them today, whereas 20 years ago, someone may or may not have had a watch on their wrist. Yeah. And plus, kids have mobile phones today. And I think most kids maybe don't have watches. By kids, I mean five-year-olds. Right. Yes. Five-year-olds usually carry iPhones these days. It's, it's getting ridiculous. Are you joking? But Because um, I'm being serious. But five-year-olds with iPhones? Five-year-olds with I phones? I haven't seen a five-year-old. With phones. I haven't seen a five-year-old with a phone. Maybe not then, own a phone, but I've seen your five-year-old used to play on a phone. Oh, they're you. Oh, they're you. They're, yeah, yeah. No, they use phones for sure, but they don't actually have one with right. a functioning telephone number yeah, but, contract. No, hang on. You say use phones, right? Now, this is something else that we need to talk about because, um, sure, I have a phone, but I rarely actually make calls. I rarely ac- actually speak to people on the phone. It's a communication device in terms of email and messaging and stuff like that. But the whole old world way of sort of putting something up to my ear and then talking into it, that's not something I do so much. Well, I think as a percentage of overall phone usage, it's vanishingly small. I mean, most people, I, re- I read just this morning that the average number of times an iPhone user unlocks their phone is 80 times a day. So you're constantly fingering your phone, but and the, the percentage of the overall time where you're interacting with it, uh, there's a very, very small percentage of time you're actually making a phone call on it. Because there's so many other ways to communicate, and a lot of the other methods of communication are more appropriate or, you know, they're, they're more um, information-dense, perhaps. Uh, you know, sending somebody a text message rather than, you know, Interrupting them with a telephone call is, is preferable in many instances. Well, I said a communications device, and we were talking about communications, but that's not even like most of the story. It's an entertainment device. It's, it's, it's true. Things have certainly changed, and uh, a, a lot of that, if not most of that, is down to the, the technology that is available these days. But going way, 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 way back, um, I sort of wanted to assemble a very basic timeline here. I mean, just reading around the subject of uh, mobile telephony it, it's it's very it's huge it's absolutely massive the the industry is vast every part of mobile telephony is vast and so it's no wonder that so many companies have wanted to get into it and you know it's just, just it's just so huge it's incredible just the technology alone is is mind-blowingly vast with a, a, at least a thousand acronyms um so it's it's quite a complicated field but i was reading that the first ever truly mobile telephone call was made way back in 1973, apparently. That was the first mobile phone call. But what does it actually mean to make a mobile phone call? I mean, what does it actually mean? So in back in 1973, a chap had a box that wasn't plugged into the wall, and he was able to punch a couple of buttons on it and speak to somebody not in that room. So what's actually going on? <laughs> it's not plugged in. There's no copper wire going into a little outlet. It, it is wireless. So, you know, <laughs> wireless communications. That's pretty amazing. It goes back hundreds of years. Um, and uh, the most recent developments were by Marconi. And it's radio waves. So mobile telephones are radio transceivers. It's all about radio, which it hasn't really changed fundamentally for you know, since the discovery of radio waves. So the very early telephones, the ones in the 70s and 80s, they were what we would now consider to be 1G, first generation. And how they worked is that it was analog. They're using frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum to send and receive. So originally you would have um, CB radios and point-to-point radios. I remember when I was a kid, I used to play with soldiers, and there was always two soldiers, which I sort of always never played with. Oh, that was toy the ra- the soldiers, radio. you mean? It was, yeah, it was the radio guy, you know, army men. It was the radio guy and the guy with the metal detector. I never I never liked those. I liked the guys, with the, the soldiers with the guns. I wasn't interested in these, these other ones. But the guy with the radio on his back, um, what was happening there is that they're sending radio waves, but they're using two different, uh, they're using the same frequency. So they have the same slice of the electromagnetic spectrum for sending and receiving. So it's like a CB radio. You have to hold down the button and say, over. And over means, okay, now you can speak. Because you couldn't speak over each other at the same time. You're using the same frequency. 
So you'd say over, 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 and then out. And not over and out. You never say over and out. That, that makes no sense. Over and out basically means you wait for someone's response and then you hang up the phone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Over means over to you, nah. <laughs> but that's, that's so-called a half duplex um, communication. So it happens only in one direction, effectively, at, at a time. Uh, and then came along um, full duplex, which would absorb two frequencies, uh, so you would have devices that are capable of sending on one frequency and receiving on another frequency, in which case you can have a fairly normal conversation, all using analog um, radio waves. So that's how it all started. It all started with just analog radio waves, which would tear a huge chunk out of the broadcast spectrum. So very few people could have conversations at any one time. So literally a handful of people in a whole city would be able to communicate because it'd be soaking up so much of the spectrum with these... Uh, analog wavelengths um, but that's how it was so people who were rich enough to afford a mobile phone uh, which needed a massive range because there weren't very many transmitters um, they would uh, they would have to wait turns almost in order to have a conversation uh, and then you had car phones which were quite popular but again they were all analog so you know you either had to wait your turn or it had to be so expensive that there were very few. Yeah, years. well, that was the thing. You say car phones were quite popular, but they were insanely expensive. Just so prohibitively expensive for the, the every person. So you had to be a superstar to not only have a car phone, but to also make those payments on the car phone. It's something like a $4,000 um, initial cost, like in 1989 or something like that. And then God knows how much for your monthly charge, m monthly fees. Absolutely crazy expensive. And obviously, coverage was always a problem. So, again, the, the underlying technology for mobile phones, what makes it all possible, are the, the networks. So, you have little radios, and these radios need to connect with the existing hardware network. So, all the copper cables in the ground and over overhead copper, copper cables. And the way you do that is you have a base station or a transmitter. So your phone needs to connect with a transmitter, and the transmitter is hardwired into the telephone network, the switched telephone network. Um, and they rapidly worked out that the best way you can have geographical coverage is to have multiple transmitters, obviously. Um, but you couldn't you were still restricted by the number of frequencies that you could have. So this is the major problem with mobile phones. It was so restricted. You know, you, know, you really couldn't have a, an explosion of users because you're dealing with a limited range of the spectrum. This was the big, big, big problem in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but quite quickly, the so-called cellular um, network design was struck upon and and agreed as a, as a virtual standard worldwide. And fundamentally, the way it works is that you have a base station. A base station is a pole or, you know, some sort of vertical assembly, uh, which is effectively triangular. And on each side of the triangle, you have an antenna or antennas these days, and each antenna has a 120 degree arc. So with three sides of the transmitter, the transceiver rather, you have 120 degrees, which is a corner of a hexagonal cell. So it's just like a honeycomb. Are honeycombs hexagonal? I think they are. So a cellular network looks like a, just a, a, a mesh of contiguous hexagons with a transmitter at every corner. And the hexagons can be different sizes. So you can have a, a res, you know, a, a very small resolution, as it were, if you think of hexagons as pixels. And then you can have subpixels and subpixels. So a really dense area, like a city, you'll have smaller hexagons. And more rural areas, you'll have much larger hexagons, but with perhaps more powerful transmitters. And each transmitter is connected physically into a wired network, whatever that wired network is. And that's basically what cellular, cellular um, networks are. They're actually hexagonal structures of wireless transceivers. So mobile phones don't necessarily, all mobile phones are not necessarily cellular phones. A cell phone is a phone that talks 
to a cellular network. But there are other types of phones. You have satellite phones. Satellite phones are not cell phones. Satellite phones talk to satellites, so it's a completely different technology. So um, cell phones are cell phones. All mobile phones are not necessarily cell phones. Uh, so once the infrastructure is in place, the actual transceivers and masts and base stations and all that stuff, and the, and the backhaul connections, the copper fibers, that rather the copper cables and later on fiber cables that run between each transmitter, you then have your infrastructure. And once the infrastructure is in, then you can do really clever things. And the clever, clever, clever thing about the cellular network is that you still have to use the a set number of frequencies in the spectrum, but you can have the same frequencies in different cells. So if you're driving your car along, going through multiple cells, you can have one frequency in one cell, and then it'll hand off to another frequency in the contiguous cell, and then you continue on to the next cell after that, and you may get the same frequency again. Because you can do that. You've subdivided, and you've sort of increase the density of connections. So they solved the problem of a limited number of uh, frequencies by having this sort of repeating cellular pattern in the network, which is genius. I mean, it's just absolutely genius. So whenever you look at any of these masts, which you, you see everywhere, um, indeed, they are triangular. And they typically have three, three sets of three antennas on the sides uh, for the various different flavors of uh, connectivity that, that is available now but uh i thought that was amazing i thought yeah that's a genius idea to have a hexagonal sort of mesh that you can roll out uh, and it has scalability and uh, once that came in then then the mobile phones could really take off and you know you had absolute unbelievable multitude of different manufacturers and uh, models from the 80s and onwards i mean I, I i never had a mobile phone in the 80s um but in the 90s, I had pagers before the mobile phones came out. And then I had the very early mobile phones, which by then were digital. So from instead of, you know, the Miami Vice style analog phones, we, you, we moved into um, digital phones. And digital, the great benefit of digital is that you can then compress and have even smaller slices of the electromagnetic spectrum so you can have even more services and even more subscribers having simultaneous calls in closer areas so it just in increased um the capacity of the network basically going digital uh, 2g and then to 3g and then 4g and and by 2020 probably 5g so you know you'd look forward to gigabit speeds to our mobile phones did you ever have a pager but well i had your one uh well, after it was um taken out of service I uh, played about with it for a while. Before. BT Cellnet, I think I remember. Yeah, it was like a late 90s looking device, meaning that it looked like an iMac. Yes, it was amazing. That iMac, when uh, when it was unveiled uh, in the, bon was it Bondi Blue or Bondi Blue, however you want to pronounce it? It looked, <laughs> it was super revolutionary, that computer. And what always made me laugh was, Every manufacturer copied that sort of translucent plastic look, including no matter that, what the, um, that no matter what the manufacturer, manufacturer was, or no matter what they were making, you know, from watches to Hoovers to dentures. I mean, absolutely everything had to be some sort of transparent plastic. You know, it's amazing the the design influence that uh, Apple has, and we'll get we'll, we'll get to Apple. <laughs> we'll be we'll be talking about them a little bit later on, but yeah. So in the seventies. And 80s, you had lots of analog phones. But then in the 90s, we started having many more digital um, devices. But I think the digital devices really started. I also thought mobile phones were, at, at that time, they were phones. You know, you used them to make calls. Because there wasn't really much else you could do with them. But where the smartphone started out was in PDAs so-called these were personal digital assistants so they're little tiny pocket pocket sized computers that do your calendar and scheduling and you know calculator functions and contacts and stuff like that and you back then you used to synchronize these things with your computer so if you had a laptop computer you would synchronize it using infrared which was like magic or you would uh, plug in some sort of 
serial cable into it or a docking station that was plugged into a serial cable and it would synchronize all of your personal information but it, it wasn't a mobile phone so you would have to carry a phone and a pda at the same time which had benefits because you could be on a call with somebody and actually see your pda and the information that you're relaying to the person rather than look you know pulling the phone away from your mouth and looking at the screen and then putting it back to your mouth are you still there Are you still there hang on it's on my phone somewhere one moment and try not to disconnect the call so PDAs, which were the smart part of smartphones, started off as not phones. They were just the smart parts. And then mobile phones were dumb, but they had the connectivity. So I waited years for those two to come together, you know, in a really compelling product. And I, I sort of thought I saw that happen with some of the uh, Nokias and some of the um, Palm devices. So Palm ruled the PDA world. Uh, and then they sort of brought out a phone called the Trio. Um, and this is early 2000s, I guess. It's even out of the 90s, I think. And then these were the, the first smartphones. And they had little styluses and, you know, they're really fiddly and um, pretty terrible. You know, low resolution screens and not brilliant. Um, so they're a bit disappointing even back then, even though they're fairly groundbreaking at the time. But that was the 90s and the early 2000s. So... You know, right at the edge of my memory, but I remember seeing all these cool smartphones coming out. And I think in the 2000s, things really started accelerating a lot because in the 2000s, you had the first 3G phones come out. So you had things like uh, there's a network in the UK called 3, and they were so called because they were a 3G network, which mostly meant more data. You know, you could almost download things like web pages and things so that the promise was the internet because the internet was happening in a big way so the next big leap was to get mobile phones on the internet and it was kind of happening at the beginning of the noughties but uh, it was still all pretty disappointing uh, and then came along the iphone <laughs> so the iphone happened in 2007 it was unveiled do you remember the iphone the original one yeah of course i do it was only in 2007 did you have one? No. Uh, no, it took a while before I had an iPhone. I had an iPhone in 2011 when the iPhone 4 came out, and it was um, immediately a much better design than the iPhone, the original iPhone, because it had um, it had like actual edges to it where you could actually stand it up, uh, whereas the original iPhone was all kind of rounded. And weirdly, they've gone back to that, so they've taken a few backward steps, in my opinion. But before the um, before the iPhone came out, I remember there was a lot of chatter about iPhone entering the uh, entering the mobile phone world. Um, and very um, famously, there's that clip with um, Steve Ballmer. <laughs> no, but maybe that was shortly after the iPhone came out. I don't know what Microsoft were doing in the phone world by that time. What, what was uh, Microsoft's phone portfolio like in 2007? Um it was pretty terrible. They they brought out some really super advanced seeming phones using like, um, do you remember Sinclair, Clive Sinclair of ZX Spectrum fame and the Sinclair C5 little electric tricycle? He always made mistakes with design where he would miniaturize things, but he would miniaturize everything. He would miniaturize the buttons that you were meant to press with your fingers. So you'd be amazed at how small the device is, but it'd be unusably bad as far as ergonomics are concerned. Microsoft, you know, just not being known for making terrible mistakes, they they sort of took a desktop approach to mobile phones and, and PDA devices. So the operating systems they had on their early smartphones were, it was like using Windows 95. It was just diabolically awful really terrible god-awful um experience and i think it went up to windows 6.1 i think i mean they had an embedded windows system called wince brilliantly named win windows ce compact edition and they had a sort of variant of that in their phones and it was just dire i had a really really high-end windows phone for work and it was uh one from o2 I forget what it was called, but it had, you know, capacitive touchscreen, a stylus, a slide-out keyboard, millions of features. And it was it ran like a 
dog and it was really complicated. You didn't know what the hell was going on. It was literally unusable. Literally, I, I couldn't use it. I literally just put it in my drawer and forgot all about it. Um, God awful. So that was a massive failure for, for Microsoft. The first of their massive failures in the smartphone world. But it was, it was terrible. Everything was terrible. Before the iPhone came out, there were a couple of companies, this handspring company, which I think was some sort of spin-off from Palm, or, or they bought up some copyrights or, or something. I'm not sure how they're related. But anyway, they had a phone which sort of was okay. It wasn't too bad. And Nokia had a couple of phones. I remember they had the first phone with a camera on it, which was like, wow, yeah, a camera on a phone. That makes total sense. And they were all right, but, but nothing brilliant. And then the Far Eastern manufacturers, you know, Samsung, notably, and some European manufacturers, had some smartphones that used pressure-sensitive screens. You know, so way before anybody else, they had screens that you can actually touch and move things around. But they had their own software, and their software was dire and they were terrible absolutely terrible uh so when the iphone the 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 marketplace was ripe for the iphone i think apple are really excellent generally about knowing when to bring out a product you know they they know when the technology is ripe that's when they should bring something out that is actually good when the iphone came out um it blew everything else away it was there was no competition whatsoever it was a, a generation ahead of anything else and it really just was the you know the first smartphone really. Uh, it was simple. Um, it looked great. And I still think it looked great. You know, I really liked the body. It had a sort of chamfered um, perimeter around it. Some sort of uh, I never had one, but it had a what looked like a chrome ridge around the whole outside of it. Um, it sort of had a half plastic back or something on it. The back was a bit of a they messed that up a little bit. But otherwise, it was amazing. And the screen was huge, you know, absolutely huge for the time, uh, which is great. So I think it, it, was, uh, it was the first smartphone. And I think that everything exploded from 2007. It just went bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it just didn't stop. And my first iPhone, my first iPhone, I skipped the threes. Uh, my first iPhone was the four, which I thought was fabulous, except for the glass on the back. I wasn't a fan of that. Okay, well, uh, I, I don't agree. I think there was a lot of interesting stuff made by other companies at that time. Um, and don't forget, when the iPhone came out, there wasn't the App Store, which I think is what made the iPhone particularly awesome. Ballmer, he had a problem with uh, the iPhone, and he there's this very sort of um, viral video on YouTube of him completely trashing the iPhone. And one of the reasons, well, there's two reasons. One, he, he, had a, he said no one would buy an iPhone because it's so goddamn expensive. He goes, yeah, yeah, like people are going to buy a $400 phone. Like that was ridiculous to him. Absolutely. What the hell, Apple? And the other one was it clearly was going to fail because it didn't have a keyboard. So in his mind, in order for a phone to be taken seriously in the business world, in the corporate world, it needed to have a keyboard because you want to be able to type messages on it. Time very quickly showed us that he was completely wrong and apple had got it entirely right uh the whole touchscreen thing as you said you know other companies had had touchscreens you know way before the iphone came along but i think it was apple that kind of made an actual thing of it that they totally went with it um even before the iphone came out i think there was the ipod touch which is the music device basically it was an i it was an iphone but without the phone part of it and it had a touch screen and people seem to like that. Oh, I didn't know that came out before the iPhone. Or concurrently, perhaps. Something like that. But BlackBerry, by the time the Apple came out, were, was a force to be reckoned with. I mean, BlackBerry, it, that was like the standard sort of corporate communications, mobile communications device, really. That then, and it seemed kind of indestructible. It, it had, well, it continued to be for a very long time. Well, yes, which we'll talk about. Um, but that kind of, uh, that seemed so um, 100% market share in the corporate world that that was Quark, Immovable. Quark Express was in the publishing world. And obviously that's totally um, died now in the way that the BlackBerry has died. But yeah, I just want to talk about BlackBerry because something that someone reminded me of recently, and I've put this in the show notes, was... Oh, but before you do, can I just, uh, on, on the topic of Bulmer... Okay. I I remember when he said that, and he said many, many, many things in a very similar fashion. And it's not whether or not um, 
Apple got it right or wrong or, you know, what where the smart money was going at the time. It's the fact that he said any of that. that that's what made him out to be an idiot. So it's not he got it wrong. It's it's the way he said it. <laughs> that's not helpful to anyone. And certainly not him. He's making he's making a bet on the future that can only discredit him. It it doesn't look good for him in any way. If even if Apple completely failed in the way that he described, he would still look like an idiot. Why? For saying for saying it how he said it. It just it, that's the the words of of a, of a moron. What do you mean? Why? <laughs> Well, because you don't. What what he should have said is he should have he should have lauded the iPhone, and he should have said, you know, that's the sort of direction we all need to move in, you know, and we we need to take risks, and you know, f- the future is about change. Yeah, but why would he have so said I, that? I, I I commend them for that. However, we think that you know it's more realistic to have a keyboard and whatever, whatever. You do. Not, so you know, I mean, just, you are purely talking about PR and not talking about what someone actually feels. So I don't think he would ever say what you just said because I don't think no, he ever he thought... No, of course he that's no, not no, him. No, yeah, that's not him. I'm not a mind reader, but I don't think he ever actually thought that what anything Apple did was good in the way that he just came out and said it was complete total crap. And if were he to say, well, I think it's really great that Apple are doing this, da, 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 I think he'd be being dishonest. Um, well, maybe. I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not. it's not a question of whether or not he's being honest. It's a question of... Uh, just diplomacy com- and yeah, uh, com- comportment. common sense. But, but it's just that he's setting himself up for failure. Right. If you, if you make those burning prophetic indictments against I- anything that has a future, then, you know, you're just going to burn yourself. There, there's, he had nothing to gain from any of that. There, there was no benefit to all of that. He was just I setting fire to himself. You know what? I, I, I sort of don't agree. Because I think, you know, that's sort of Balmer's style. He's this real blunt gregarious force. idiot yeah not, he can't be an idiot because he's i don't know god he just seems so dumb i mean i no, know he's, not. he's a he's, billionaire exactly. and all the rest of it but, he knows what he's doing god. he knows what he's talking about but he's just um a kind of comedy character i suppose but if the iphone would have failed and you know been, been the zoon of um apple i'm pretty sure that that would have lionized um balmer it's like well balmer did say and the clip of Balmer, yep, mm. got that right, Balmer. Wow, what a visionary. We should listen to this guy more often. <laughs> exactly. It's sort of like an, a negative vision. No one would ever clap him on the back. It's things that you get right, not no, things that you... because... Oh, actually, I'm not sure. Maybe this more speaks to your side of the argument, actually. I was going to draw an analogy with how um, Steve Jobs didn't mince his words. You know, he kind of totally spoke his mind and was applauded and lauded and heroized. What's that correct word? Um, yeah, I, I can't think. Made a hero. Made a hero. Made a hero <laughs> of. But he actually did um, kind of preface his bashing of Microsoft because uh, in that uh, it was way before the iPhone. But in the Triumph of the Nerds documentary, when he was talking about why he doesn't like Microsoft, he did actually say, you know, they deserve their success for the most part. But then he goes, the problem I have is that they just make some really poor quality products or, or something like that. I can't remember. But it seems like Steve Jobs had already engineered um, his sort of place in the tech world as this crazy genius guy that a lot of people have a lot of respect for. I don't think that's the same with um, Balmer or Bill Gates. Uh, Balmer was talking about the future of the iPhone more than what the iPhone actually was, I think. The power of what he was saying was that it was going to fail because X, Y, and Z. That's the difference. He's not criticizing... He wasn't so much criticizing the product as it is. He was criticizing the future that it may or may not have had. And I think that's just, you know, there's nothing to be gained in that. Um, But you moved on to BlackBerry. They did own the corporate world. At that time, uh, they were huge, uh, and their USP was email. So email is this horrible means of communication that I I battle with on a daily basis. But um, BlackBerry very efficiently put email in your pocket. And that was, uh, you know, for business, that's absolutely fantastic. I mean, you really could very quickly and easily send email from your phone. That was purported to be secure and um it was hugely useful and people love their blackberry i take you know, issue with what you've just said oh yes 
Yeah, I remember someone I knew in the corporate world uh, was given a BlackBerry and I was tasked with trying, this is a friend, and I was tasked with trying to figure out how to actually set it up so she could receive, send and receive email. And yes. I was too dumb. It was yeah, too hard. It, it, that's why IT people did it. That was the thing about, the thing about BlackBerry is that you're given one. You can send and receive email on this, Mr. Corporate Drone. Yes, but this is what was so glorious about the way Apple does everything. They kind of like looked at the BlackBerry, I'm imagining, and thought, why is this so weirdly hard? And they made it super easy. They made it so you buy an iPhone and then it works. Well, no, they didn't make anything super easy because they couldn't do what BlackBerry did. They were operating in different markets. There was no central management facility for Apple iPhones. There was no way you could manage a thousand iPhones Jeff, for your staff. I'm simply talking about sending receiving sending and receiving email on a phone. No, what you're what you're talking about is setting up email. That's completely different. Yes, on a BlackBerry, it's incredibly hard, or was at the time. And generally, the IT people would do it. What I'm talking about is setting up and setting up email to send and receive email on a phone is easier on the iPhone. It was a walk in the park. Yes, but it, it was, a, it was a, a lot more limited. You couldn't... The email that you'd send and receive on a BlackBerry wasn't the same kind of email that you were setting up on an iPhone. It was corporate email that connected to corporate networks, and there's lots of encryption and lots of other things taken into consideration. It wasn't just pop email from a pop mail server. It was honestly, honestly different. Uh, Microsoft tried to bring out phones that connected with corporate networks, and considering Microsoft owned the administrative back end of the corporate networks through their Microsoft servers and their their mail servers. So Microsoft, are, you know, one of their biggest products is a email server, the Exchange server. You'd think that they would have beaten BlackBerry to corporate email connectivity, but they didn't. So companies would buy BlackBerry servers to to sit right next to their Microsoft Exchange servers. So an extra expense, an extra box to look after, uh, in order to get their their um, staff, Blackberries, when you'd think that Microsoft had a natural advantage in that they are the email server. Surely they could build phones that connect to the email server better and more and more reliably than the Blackberries. But they couldn't, and they failed at it. So they had every possible advantage, and they still managed to fail. So, you know, Microsoft and phones, I don't know, it's crazy. What struck me as uh, an incredible example of how technology changes or how fast technology moves um, is only five years ago when we when London was in flames remember the L- London riots no try harder I, I don't remember five years ago what happened London riots what were they about seriously oh was this just some I don't remember what it was about. It was no just some. It was like all of London was locked down because there was these gang. Yes. I I, I lived in London at the time. I don't remember being locked down. I was living in London at the time. I remember all the shops. Hang on, Jeff. All the shops were closed, I remember, where I was living anyway. Well, where you were living. Um, (laughs) I I remember. I remember with you. I'm just trying to remember what they were about. I think it was just. There was some, some. Something caused the riots, but I forget what it was. It wasn't the poll tax that happened much, much farther back in time. Um, I forget what it was. Okay, Jeff. No, I'm going to have to read this. This is the uh, 2011 England riots. Um, between 6th and 11th of August, thousands of people rioted in several London boroughs. So thousands of people in cities and towns across England. The resulting chaos generated looting, arson, and mass deployment of police resulted in the death of five people. Disturbances began after a protest in Tottenham, London, following the death of Mark Duggan, a local man who was shot dead by police on the 4th of August. Several violent clashes with police ensued along the destruction of police vehicles, a double-decker bus, and many homes and businesses, thus rapidly gaining the attention for the media. Overnight, looting took place in Tottenham Hale Retail Park in nearby Wood Green. The following day, similar... And just like people I work with were saying, you know, like Enfield, for example, it's like, you know, Enfield, we had to stay in our houses. And my 
friend was talking about these gangs that were marauding the streets. No, I remember some McDonald's being um, vandalized in around the Trafalgar Square area, but I honestly don't remember much else. I am sorry. I just don't remember. Well, there was a total of 3,443 crimes across London linked to the disorder, along with five deaths. At least 16 others were injured as a result of the related violent acts. An estimated £200 million worth of property damage was incurred, and local economic activity was significantly compromised. I remember all of the shops where I was working in London were closed. The online video website, YouTube, was soon to... Anyway, the reason why I bring this up is because the part that BlackBerry played in all of this. And this is just crazy, because in 2011, kids used BlackBerry phones. Because of BBM. Yeah. So BBM was their messaging platform, which is very good. So this is, uh, them, this is the Wikipedia page about the riots talking about the BlackBerry Messenger. And I totally forgot about this. And it's amazing how just stuff just disappears. So there were reports that the BlackBerry... Well, certainly disappeared from my memory. There were reports that the BlackBerry Messenger service was used by looters to organize their activities and that inflammatory and inaccurate accounts of Mark Duggar's killing on social media sites may have incited disturbances. One of the many messages shared between users was the following, and it's just like a message about, hey, let's meet up. And um, there you go. Start... Uh, F to feds, bring your ballys, your bally trolleys, car vans, hammers, the lot. <laughs> but uh, I remember a lot of chatter uh, across the news networks about BlackBerry. Um, and there's this campaign about, you know, demonizing BlackBerry as a platform. Maybe that helped uh, hasten to their demise. Who knows? But it just seems like a, an absolute lifetime ago now that the iPhone is so ubiquitous. And I mean, I don't know what kids are using, but I imagine most of them are, are using iPhones. Yeah, I remember, I mean, I used to use Blackberries many, 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 many years ago. Um, and it was a definite love-hate relationship. They, they seemed terrible in many, many ways. They were hard to set up. They had some major weird quirks. And quite often you would have to pull the battery out because they just would stop responding or go completely crazy. So I think they were quite buggy. And I was generally just unimpressed. They were ugly. Um, the operating system was quite ugly. And I, I wasn't a fan, but um, I liked the little ball. They had a little track ball in them. And I thought editing, actually writing on the keyboard and then editing things, you know, positioning the cursor and inserting text, all of that worked very well. But then um, they sort of revamped their company um, and, and, and changed the whole direction of their, uh, of their platform when they started getting battered because the iPhone was able was then able to connect to the Microsoft networks and to do a lot more and they had so much competition that they ditched their old operating system and had a new fresh operating system which was really excellent absolutely fantastic and I was a, a very devoted BlackBerry user for a very long time with their new operating system uh, it's really excellent I still think it's the slickest and bug-free operating system I've ever used However, uh, they went into serious, serious decline, and now they're, they're virtually dead in the water, uh, which is terrible, but, you know, that's progress. And the death blow to BlackBerry is the recent revela revelations that what everybody assumed was a super secure platform with an unbelievably secure encrypted um, communication uh, suite of protocols actually wasn't secure at all. In fact, BlackBerry gave uh, BlackBerry built all of their encryption for their phones around a global key, and they gave that global encryption key to the Canadian um, police force, I believe. Oh, really? So effectively, with this global key, you can decrypt any BlackBerry huh. and get all the information out of it. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> here we are watching Apple defending its encryption and saying, look, we're not going to build a global key for you, American government. Uh, whereas BlackBerry just gave it to their government. Um, and, and yet their USP these days is that it's a super secure platform. Well, it isn't. And that's the only reason why you would buy a BlackBerry anymore. So they're super de duper dead, which is a shame. But they were a huge, huge, huge player. But the world changes, new technologies come along, and you know these the, the latest phones are are going in a completely different direction. So there's a lot of casualties, uh, but Apple have uh, maintained an incredible momentum with their iPhone platform, uh, and they just seem just 
unbeatable. They they are the market leaders by far, by an amazing uh, an amazing stretch. But going back in time a little bit, there have been some real high points in mobile phones, especially smartphones, that I I remember with my limited memory. But I remember the iPhone coming out. Uh, but very soon after the iPhone came out, an Android phone came out. And I, <laughs> I thought it was an amazing, amazing phone. It was a T-Mobile G1. And I think it was made by HTC, which I believe is a Korean manufacturer. And this phone had a built-in keyboard because, you know, people didn't want to get rid of those, the physical keyboard, because the touch keyboard on the original iPhone wasn't super brilliant. It was really good. But, you know, it, it definitely, you fumbled around with it, which was because people weren't used to touching on glass, I suppose. And also the technology, you know, the, wasn't quite good enough for, for perfect typing every time. Uh, but this, the Android platform, which is from Google, um, which is kind of like an open, an open operating system. Manufacturers can install Google's operating system on their hardware for free, whereas Apple only, you know, they have proprietary hardware. You have to buy an Apple piece of hardware in order to run Apple software. Um, so the completely opposite sort of um, uh, paradigm is Google's Android. And the first phone uh, was this G1. And it was an, it was amazing. It was, it was quite quick. The screen was beautiful. It had widgets on the screen, um, which the iPhone didn't have, and it had a physical keyboard. But one thing it didn't have that the iPhone did have was a headphone jack. And I'm positive that's what killed it because people couldn't plug in their headphones into this smartphone. And, uh, you know, what are you thinking? We can't go back to the bad old days of Blackberries that had a 2.5 millimeter headphone jack on it. I mean, what? Who has headphones that has a 2.5 millimeter um, plug? That's insane. And other manufacturers like Sony, who you had to use a proprietary adapter in order to plug headphones into it. I just, at the time, I didn't understand why phone manufacturers weren't putting standard audio jacks on their phones. Uh, but they weren't. So, you know, again, another major win for the iPhone. Make it as compatible as possible. Um, which is, I think, opposite. the opposite is true these days. But at the time, uh, that was that was much better than all the other phones that were out. That's weird. I think Apple are quite good at that kind of thing. Like, I don't think they go out of their way to be spiteful when it comes to making things propri- proprietary, or at least not in every instance. Um, and yeah, the iPhone has always had just a regular standard headphone jack. But then again, it's always been kind of tradition for the iPhone to ship with the crappiest headphones. And so <laughs> that would be really sucky if you could only use their crappy headphones on their uh <laughs> On, on yeah. the right, like on, on the on the rumored iPhone Seven, which will which won't have a two point five millimeter jack, and you'll have oh, really? to use some sort of lightning adapter. Ah, you yeah. say that I use Bluetooth um, with my uh, or, or, or or yeah, or Bluetooth. Yeah. So another highlight that I remember from mobile phones recently was a phone called the Palm Pre. So this is sort of I, I, either it was a spin off company from Palm, the ones who made the very 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 popular PDAs. Um, or it's the same company who sort of revamped their outlook. But it was a, a really, really futuristic-looking small pebble-shaped phone that had even it had a physical keyboard that slid out, but the actual keys were clear plastic, which seemed to have the letters suspended, embedded inside a little bubble of clear plastic, so they would never wear out. I mean, you know, there's no paint to scratch, there's no... You won't. We'll never rub out the the little characters because they're actually embedded in the plastic. Just absolutely fabulous. And the operating system was light years ahead of everything, including Apple. I mean, the way it worked and it used cards, which I think all phones have now standardized on. But your different applications were effectively little cards that you could flick away um, to close. Uh, it was just incredibly futuristic phone, which completely died without a trace. It was weird how quickly it just completely disintegrated, but I thought it was such, such a good idea. And the operating system was called WebOS, and it was just beautiful looking. You know, I, I just failed to understand how it failed. And another phone that was just astoundingly beautiful in every way was by Nokia. So in the 90s, Nokia was the market leader by far, in a way. This uh, Finnish company... Um, just sold more smartphones than everybody else combined. Uh, and they had, uh, well, not so much smartphones, but they're, they're sort of 2G and 
fledgling 3G phones were incredibly popular and everybody had Nokia phones. I thought I had a few and they're super reliable, uh, awesome, uh, awesome uh, hardware. Everything was great. Uh, but then they sort of, they were falling behind. The iPhone was killing everybody and a lot of other manufacturers were iterating their technology quicker. And Nokia seemed to be needing a real boost and they were sort of struggling. But they were working on this project um, where they had a kind of sort of open source inspired operating system called Migo. And they had this new hardware in the shape of uh, the N8, which didn't run Migo, it ran, ran their older operating system. But they had a new phone called the N9. And it was a slab style phone of seamless polycarbonate plastic. So it was polycarbonate plastic that's colored, so it's not painted, so it scratches nicely. Um, it had a beautiful sculpted glass front. It had no physical buttons, and it ran the simplest and most beautiful operating system, this uh, Mego Harmutti, I think. And it effectively had a screen for all of your app icons, it had a screen for all of your currently running programs. And then it had another screen for all of your messages. So regardless of what your messages were from, you know, tweets or emails, it just had one chronological timeline of all of your social media and everything coming in in one stream that you could read through. Very simple. The phone was just beautiful. But it was released just as Microsoft bought and then subsequently destroyed the company. And it was terrible. A terrible, awful loss to what could have been a fantastic line of products. But again, I blame Microsoft for this. Um, there was a micro ex-Microsoft person running the company, and then after a couple of years, guess what happened? Microsoft came in and bought the whole shooting match. And I think, you know, talking about embedding your agent. That's the three E's. Uh, 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 three Extend, E's? embrace, extinguish. No, isn't it embrace, extend, and extinguish? Extinguish yeah. is definitely the last one anyway. Extend as in reaching out like pinchers. Uh, embrace as in squeeze the life out of and then extinguish when you, oh, they're dead. Okay. Um, so, yes, the N9 was another high point, I thought, in design and technology. Um, and, and, you know, there are a few other interesting phones out there. There were a couple of Sony Ericsson's. There's a, a couple of uh, Samsung phones that seem quite forward thinking but most of the technology it would seem was refined best by the iphone i mean they really completely dominated up until probably right now i don't think anything is really eclipsing them i think samsung is giving them a, a run for their money but um we are we are enjoying the latest and greatest smartphones i think most new smartphones that are out today are so-called 4g so we're in fourth generation mobile infrastructure uh, communication technology so fourth generation uh, in this country, and I think the United States as well, is, uh, is a battle between two different sets of protocols. One is WiMAX and the other one is LTE. Um, we have a glossary in the notes. Uh, there are lots of acronyms here, so I'm not going to spell them out. But uh, these are there's a war between these two um, 4G technologies, and it's very much reminiscent of VHS versus Betamax. And WiMAX is unfortunately sounds like Betamax. Um, LTE is winning or has won. Um, so most 4G phones, certainly in Europe, are LTE. I don't think WiMAX really made it to Europe. Uh, in the States, I think there's still some WiMAX out there somewhere. But these new technologies are potentially super fast. I mean, you can get up to 40 or 50 megabit downloads on 4G LTE, which is amazing. You know, it's enough to watch Netflix and download some music, you know, and synchronize all of your email, you know, while you're out and about. So it's incredible technology that we have now. I mean, really incredible. And, and you were saying earlier on about how we have little portable computers in our pockets. And uh, these little devices are far more powerful than desktop PCs were, you know, only five years ago. So the incredible power uh, is insane. And the, the technology, uh, just some of the technology that these things incorporate, just a, a short list 
of the sorts of things that you might find in a new smartphone. So pick, to pick a phone at random, the new Samsung. So Samsung is a mega corporation. It's like the corporation of South Korea. Uh, they're absolutely huge, huge. And they produce tens of millions of phones and other technologies, uh, dev- technological devices uh, a year. Um, but here is just a quick rundown of the sorts of technology that you'll find in these little mobile platforms. Reinforced glass. So the the display is covered in a, a, a pane of glass. But of course, glass being glass, you drop your phone, it's going to smash. But the glass that they use is so strong. It's like stronger than like for like aluminium. Uh, they're scratch resistant. Uh, they have the actual display, the liquid crystal display is bonded to the glass. And in the Samsung phones, in some of the models, it's actually curved at the edges, which is kind of bizarre because it means you have glare at any angle, but, you know, it's fashion. Uh, You have radio transmitters inside these phones with multiple network protocols. So they can do, you know, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC for very close payments and file transfers, and probably a few others. You have... um... Hello, listener. This is Ben. I'm afraid that due to a technical fault, this is where the recording stopped. Perhaps the world wasn't ready for where this conversation was going. In any case, our outro music was then, and is still, a medley of ringtones. Presumably someone gathered together and edited these, but I don't have a name to credit them. Until next time.